much for now, 19 years, I think it is, 19 or 20. And um, I'm really sorry that our director warns that it can't be here. She's uh, not able to be with us. But in the back, I'd like to thank the wonderful administrators of the Robert Penn Warren Center, Terry Tripp and Mary Pretty Lindstrom. Yay! <laughs> Um, I'd also like to thank the other centers and programs who have generously supported this event, including the Center for Latin American, Caribbean, and Latinx Studies, directed by Celso Castillo here up in the front. The Graduate School VU Edge Program, directed by Don Brunson, who will be here a little bit later at four. The Program in African American and Diaspora Studies, directed by Tracy Sharper Whiting, and the Department of History, chaired by Andy Wright Reeves. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, so today's seminar is an offshoot of the Slave Society's Digital Archive Project that uh, I direct and that, for which Daniel Jenkins is the executive director. And it's in the basement <laughs> of this building if any of you would care to come by. We've been running this project for 20 years as well. And um, it, we take teams of our graduate students out into the field to preserve the oldest records for Africans and indigenous people in the Atlantic world. And uh, after all these years, we now hold a million digital images from a wide variety of uh, locations in Latin America and Africa. And as I said, it's the oldest serial records where we can recreate uh, large swaths of history. And I hope uh, others of you will be interested in working with us as well. We estimate that it's between four to six million people documented in primarily uh, church records from these locations, but also notarial records and archaeology, even if we can find it. Um, so, some of our speakers today have been a part of these projects, these field projects, and others have worked in the Slave Society's digital archive on more technical aspects. Um, so, you're all welcome to come see us, visit us, do an immersion project, whatever it might be. Um, and anyway, thank you so much for being here and. Uh, I have the pleasure now of introducing speakers, but I'm going to do each one before they speak. And then I'm going to need my red folder back there. Daniel, can you get it? Because I'm going to be in session. That's it. Thank you so much. Or is it just the question leaves back there? Is that it? Maybe. I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, so what we're going to do is introduce everybody one by one as they speak, and then we save some time in the end for questions and answers. Um, and again, thanks to all our supporters uh, for doing this. So our first speaker today is Jesus Luis, who's currently a National Academy of Sciences Ford Foundation postdoctoral fellow in Caribbean history with us. He earned his doctorate with distinction from Tulane University's Latin American Studies program. Uh, in May 2020, and that's where Jesus and I first met. And most recently, he was also a fellow for the American Council of Learning Society's Emerging Voices Postdoctoral Fellowship, uh, which he also spent with us here. Um, he was also connected to the Duke University's uh, programs, especially Dr. Laurent Dubois' program in Haiti, and uh, we're very happy to have him with us. He has just finished uh, a wonderful New manuscript on Saint Domingue and it's under consideration. <laughs> <laughs> it's under consideration for publication. We're confident it's coming out anytime soon. So Jesus will speak to us today about his work uh, in Haiti and Saint Domingue uh, and in the Dominican Republic on ephemeral dominions, black fugitivity in the Caribbean and Hispaniola. Jesus. Uh, 
Good afternoon. Thank you for, for, for having me uh, here, Jane, and um, Theron, and Daniel, and everybody at our RPW. Um, it's, it's been a pleasure to, to, to be welcomed into the Vandy and, and Nashville community. Uh, it's, it's been really nice to, uh, to sort of feel the professional camaraderie, but also just sort of the love um, outside of the, the pocket that is Vanderbilt. So, so I really appreciate it. Appreciate you guys all. Um, very briefly, I would be remiss. Um, uh, I haven't, I haven't talked about this with a lot of people, but uh, for the last two years, I was uh, an asylum officer for the United States government, and so um, that's a major part of my personal story and professional story. I'm sort of back now in the academic world, but um, I would be remiss if I did not start today there uh, by calling our attention to the southern border. Um, where there is presently a black diaspora uh, seeking protection from our country and not just being denied said protection, but being further displaced in mass, in, mass, uh, in horrific ways. Uh, the Haitian exodus we're presently witnessing uh, has been happening throughout the 20th century, um, more pointedly after the US occupation, which ends in 1934. Um, and so for me, this is all the more disconcerting given the fact that it is not just the United States that has historically uh, engaged in these xenophobic and quite frankly anti-black uh, immigration policies, uh, but also because this is a hemispheric reality, uh, really a global phenomenon. Uh, so yeah, white supremacy and anti-blackness uh, have deeply affected the ways that Haitians and Haitian migrants in, in places like Chile, Argentina, Venezuela, Panama, Mexico are treated. Um, and so it is additionally frustrating given the fact that Haiti, throughout most of the 19th century, was itself a major haven for black and indigenous people across the hemisphere, um, particularly Usonian African Americans. I use Usonian, I'm sorry, I don't like to say American. I think we took that and made it our own. But so, um, so for Usonian African Americans, Haiti in the 19th century was, was quite literally a legal sanctuary. So it is within that context that I want to situate my talk today. Um, as Adam Ferrer's landmark article on Haitian anti-slavery in the 19th century showed, the fact that Haiti made its territory literal free soil has antecedents in multiple sources, from old regime concepts of European free soil to Catholic sanctuary laws. So Haiti drew upon, Haiti in the 19th century, drew upon uh, these old practices or legal uh, concepts, but more importantly, substantially transformed them. Um, they transformed them in, 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 in their view of what liberty and rights should be. So today I'm focusing more, I, I specialize on the Haitian Revolution, but I'm focusing more on how Catholic sanctuary laws, particularly in the Spanish Caribbean, um, a topic with which I know Vanderbilt audiences will be quite familiar, uh, since you've been lucky to have one of its leading scholars here, Jane. <laughs> Um, La Maestra uh, for so many years, but of course there's also uh, current professors elsewhere who, who were trained here who in part were pro part products of James Tugelich. I'm thinking Fernando Redones Lane, I'm thinking of Charlton Yingling. Uh, so I, I, I guess my hope here is, is I, first I, I hope that you've never heard of these cases that I'm going to present before, um, and then in the rare event that you have, that, uh, hopefully I shed a little bit of a different light Okay, so now I put my historian hat on and get a little boring. Well, I hope not, but I'm going to read a little bit. So on May 30th, 1768, the Spanish governor of Santo Domingo, Manuel de Astor, made official through the testimony given to him by the fiscal, sort of a municipal attorney of the town of San Felipe de la de Puerto de Plata, the decision to grant freedom to two black fugitives who had arrived in Santo Domingo from the island of San Cristobal. St. Christopher, or present-day St. Kitts and Nevis. The attorney explained that the two men named Jose La Bastida and Miguel Bautete, just as a quick side note, the priest who married my wife and I, his name is literally Jose La Bastida. So when I told him this, he had quite the chuckle. Uh, Jose La Bastida and Miguel Bautete had been captured and enslaved by the British after the seizure of the French colony of Martinique during the last years of the Seven Years' War. The British
British, it appears, took both men from Martinique after the French ceded control of the island, transporting La Bastida and Malpete to the island of St. Christopher. The Spanish lawyer noted that the French did not, quote, reclaim the men despite the terms of the 1763 Treaty of Paris. Thus, he proposed, these men were under the irrevocable, quote, dominion of the British. And just so you know, that prompted my title choice for today. They, these governors are trying to say that they're all in the irrevocable dominion. And I said, well, I want to question, right, the degree to, to which these, these empires, the so-called dominion, was irrevocable. And in fact, I want to suggest that perhaps ephemeral is a better way to understand this, and particularly during the 18th century. Anyways, his main point was that these unfortunate captives had made their escape from the British during a time of war along with the French seeking to reclaim them. Then, perhaps, it would be correct to return them to their, quote, masters in Martinique. But the governor, Aslor, argued, precisely because the preliminary, a preliminary peace of November of 1762 had been signed between the Spanish, the French, and the British, the possibility of sending these two men, La Bastida and Valpete, back to Martinique was nullified. In his view, the British had no legal claim to the former slaves, and even further, it was not acceptable for, quote, infidels to have dominion over the faithful. Talking about the British. I know, right? I had the same reaction. Following Spanish rules of amnesty, according to the attorney's report, when La Bastida and Valpete fled St. Christopher in 1763, and arrived at the northern shores of Santo Domingo, they did so with, quote, aims of becoming Christians, although one may wonder if they had been baptized as Catholics in Martinique. Apparently not. Aside from their capture and forced removal from Martinique and their escape to Santo Domingo in 1763, we know next to nothing about the lives of La Bastida and Malpete. We know that they were slaves in Martinique, and that, or that they were enslaved in Martinique, and of their supposed intention to flee to Santo Domingo. Once in Puerto de Plata, it took them about two years before they were baptized as Roman Catholics. The chief magistrate of the town, Don Esteban de Padilla, took both men and described their arrival as follows, quote, Around the year 63, we found on these posts two blacks from Guinea who spoke the French language and claimed to have escaped from a British ship that had come close to the shore. They had become prisoners during the capture of Martinique by the British, and upon arriving at the city, these blacks pro procured, after having suffered hardship in the mountains, a passport, which they intended to get to Le Cap, which is uh, presently kept uh, Francaise, or kept Haitian in Haiti, and present themselves to the general of that French nation. The attorney of the town of San Felipe asked other prisoners of war um, on the northern coast of Santo Domingo for witness testimony and after receiving corroboration, determined that those morenos should be taught the rudiments of the faith. Of the faith. Aslor then indicated that both La Bastida and Valtete wanted to receive baptism and that they, had, they held steadfastly onto the law of, quote, Christ our Father. Their religious fervor was then verified by the priest of San Felipe, who certified in both of their baptismal records that he solemnly baptized Miguel, who was a free adult of about 38 years old. The priest details how he applied oil on Miguel after having examined him on the Christian doctrine and practices of the Holy Catholic faith. The priest found Valpete Miguel to be well instructed in the doctrine and eager to receive the Holy Sacrament. He point, I, as I say Holy Sacrament, I remember this building. <laughs> um, he pointed out that Antonio de la Luez and Maria de Isla Isales were present at the baptism acting as Valtete's godparents, with Carlos de Guzman and Diego Monaga serving as witnesses. All four of the other individuals present at Miguel's baptism were, according to the priest, local parishioners. Aslor ends his declaration by adding that La Bastida and Valtete deserve all of the protection of his majesty for their heroic uh, uh, piety and inseparable character to the throne of Spain. He ordered the main authorities of the city to, quote, Put them in the home of an honorable settler who will watch over their, their instruction and the tenets of the holy faith and make them comply with their obligations as Christians and for them to work and cultivate the land in order to sustain themselves. The attorney then recommended that given all of the circumstances that these, quote, blacks, Joseph La Bastida and Miguel Valtete, uh, that they be given the protection and their freedom declared for now. Not only did these two former enslaved people become Roman Catholics, 
but approximately five years after setting foot on Spanish soil, they became ostensibly free. So I say ostensibly hesitantly because as um, Antwinum's work shows us, free castas uh, in Spanish America endured still uh, the brutality of institutionalized discrimination. Moreover, the fact that Astor specifies that their freedom is for now implies that perhaps these two blacks might still be short of becoming full vassals or subjects of Spain. Yet the long-standing questions of debates in, in the Spanish Empire with the cannon bomber are still somewhat relevant here. Surely the case of La Bastida and Baltete, specifically their religious conversion, at least demonstrates that they gained some level of, quote, moral status and possibly even a legal persona. It certainly demonstrates that Santo Domingo Spanish authorities were willing to grant La Bastida and Baltete the right to work and cultivate land for their own subsistence. While it is difficult to know whether or not these men would have been victims in an agricultural society in which exploitation by Spanish colonists was not uncommon, I think it is safe to say that they were in a position that was not only in their favor, but that was perhaps better than whatever options they might have had upon reaching French Saint-Domingue, or Haiti. Santo Domingo had developed a largely rural and subsistence-based economy with relatively strong, a strong peasantry made up of former slaves and their descendants. The act of seeking a safe haven in Spanish lands by African descendants in the Circle Caribbean was, again, as our very own uh, Professor Landers' work has demonstrated, an important phenomenon which can be traced back to the middle of the 17th century and perhaps even earlier. Uh, as, as Landers shows us, uh, various factors such as marriage status, religious standing, militia service, godparentage, uh, patronage net networks offered free people of African descent opportunities to, quote, work the Spanish system um, and find ways to become active creators of their own destinies. A little shout out to Black Society, Jane. You know, a little blast from the past there <laughs> for you. So, um, and so they, they were able to navigate various social structures in order to gauge sort of the liberatory scope. They would manipulate political disputes and they were able to respond to complicated demographic constraints in their search for autonomy. African and African descendants uh, in the Caribbean, they, they make sensible decisions, right, in order to better understanding the society. Uh, we know, scholars also show us that medieval Iberian codes, law code, known as the Siete Partidas, from uh, 1256 to 1265, set the foundation for Spanish American bureaucrats' inclination towards granting liberties to bonded vassals. As Twinham also shows us that, uh, as she says, quote, at least in theory, these codes portray slavery as a despised state that the bonded naturally would and should try to alter. It further stated that servitude is the most vile thing in the world, the code did, while, quote, liberty is the most dear and most esteemed. Evangelization was just a means by which the Spanish uh, bourbons fashioned this type of, quote, soft power over people on the fringes of empire partly due to the fact that there were various uh, motivations to adopt Christianity, there was a constant push and pull in which African descendants uh, and Spaniards vied for autonomy and control. Even though Catholicism gave enslaved people a social existence beyond the confines of slavery, these privileges were often, as Herman Bennett shows us, severely limited. Matthew Restall has showed us that, at least outwardly, Africans in Yucatecan society adopted Christianity since its, quote, rituals and institutions provided them admittance into local society. We know, for instance, in the case of colonial Quito, that African and African descendants who would escape servitude became cultural and political brokers who marshaled religious and Spanish royal discourses to mediate between the royal state and its local Afro-Amerindian and Indian subjects. And so, uh, all of this in, in light also of, of the French Code Noir, of course, uh, shows us how enslaved people uh, managed to gain their freedom um, and, and navigate this world. N yet another Vanderbilt product, uh, Chaz Yingling, he shows us that the Maroons, for instance, in Santo Domingo, uh, that while they coincided with Spanish interests, the choice made by the, the Maroons of the Manier was strategic and corresponded with the actions of Maroons in Jamaica, Colombia and elsewhere who also uh, rejoined colonial society pragmatically with legal protections for their earned free status. 
And so I, I want to situate, uh, you know, for, for me, that I want to situate the history of Haiti in this case, right, not only within the broader circumcaribbean and the Atlantic world, but also within this island-wide story of the, of the Hispaniola, the Hispaniola. And I think that, that by doing this, uh, we, we are better able to analyze these stories of, uh, like Joseph La Bastida and Miguel Balfete, which are, I think, strong examples of how African and African descendants on the island, right, uh, were adept at negotiating even the most precarious of situations. Um, they must have understood their options and that their Spanish protectors uh, may also have benefited, although that's unclear how. Uh, but the fact that they were so quick to establish or give the impression of, at least, of some sort of un unwavering loyalty and inseparable character towards the Spanish town, I think is important because it shows us that they were likely aware of the geopolitical states within which they were embroiled. Spain and France were at war with England. I, I don't believe that was lost on La Bastida and Bautete. Gagas's work has shown us how the international vying for power between the British, the French, and the Spanish would uh, interact with domestic struggles throughout the Caribbean of enslaved people rebelling for freedom. Uh, and so I do believe that La Bastida and Bautete are good examples of what it meant to be an Atlantic Creole uh, in this tumultuous time. And so I want to conclude uh, by just saying that despite the fact that these three colonial powers, England, France, and Spain, were in competition with each other, what I find really interesting is that the attorney who pushed the grant La Bastida and Bautete, their freedom, spoke in a voice that implicitly, if not explicitly, marked clear boundaries between the British way of life, um, the infidels, if you recall, and the Spanish. He went so far uh, as, excuse me, uh, he went so far as to say that these two men were faithful, unlike the British. But to what degree was the, was the Spanish bureaucrat lumping the Spanish way of life with the French? That is uh, a central question broadly in my work. I contend that he did so to some degree, but that if we take the interaction between the two fugitives and, and, their Sp and the Spanish in their totality, we can see more articulable links. For instance, the Spanish mentioned that La Bastida and Bautete spoke French, and that their intentions were to present themselves to the French authorities of Saint Domingue, since they had produced a passport after all. How and why were they able to come up with a passport is an important question in and of itself, since it would appear that La Bastida and Bautete had come to the island of Española with practically nothing. Also, what prompted these men to declare to the Spanish their intentions to travel to finish San Domingue? And why was this plan so quickly reversed? By giving the impression that they were headed for French territory, I think La Bastida and Bautete were being calculated and careful to seek aid from the Spanish first in order to avoid any possible negative reactions. Um, and so instead, by perhaps masking their transfer to San Domingue and quickly making it evident that they wanted to be instructed in the Catholic faith, La Bastida and Bautete were able to, whether genuinely or not, win favor with the Spanish authorities of Santo Domingo. While enslaved in Martinique as prisoners, uh, excuse me, what is important is that while enslaved in, Santo, in Martinique as prisoners of war in St. Christopher or at sea, the evidence here suggests that these men had some sense of how their lives might change as Catholic converts living in a Spanish colony. These men effectively went from being slaves in the French colony of, Santo, of Martinique to prisoners of the British, to seemingly free men in Spanish Santo Domingo, all in the span of five years. Which, by the way, is approximately the wait time for somebody who's been a US permanent resident for a year and to apply for citizenship. French attitudes towards the Spanish fluctuated during the middle of the latter half of the 18th century. By the 1750s and before the onset of the Seven Years' War, the French generally saw the benefits of commerce with the Spanish. In 1752, for instance, a register of the Ancien Regime commerce booklets, uh, excuse me, commerce booklets, uh, there's a note in there that lists assorted ships in Saint Domingue that propose to engage in business and trade with the Spanish. And it specifically mentions that commerce undertaken by land between Santo Domingo and Necap, again in the north of what is now Haiti, still presented a means by which well executed trade may provide precious advantages. So clearly, while colonial competition was ever present, there was also a space there for collaboration, for interchange, and 
mutual understanding. So lastly, uh, as someone who cannot understand the history of, of in, in, in sort of in, in my, in my, what I specialize, right, the Haitian Revolution, or of Haiti more broadly, uh, without understanding it through a transnational lens and situating it within the broader history of Hispaniola, Spanish Santo Domingo, and of the Spanish Empire, I really do think that these types of stories can tell us not just much about how sanctuary or asylum laws function in the 18th century in Caribbean, but how that can help us contextualize the ways that Haiti then turned into a sanctuary itself in the 19th century and how perhaps the U.S. should follow suit in the 21st. Thanks. first 
throughout the Spanish kingdom retained these maneuvers and these manipulations and these um, negotiating tactics. And um, so I'm going to give you just kind of a brief glimpse into what this kind of looked like as a group of them arrived on their hunters. So on March 19th, 1796, 78 days after leaving the dock at Fort Dauphin in the northern province of saint domingue 310 people landed in the port community after few hunters. They were men, women, children, babies, infants. There were a total of 36 family groups, the largest of which contained 27 individuals. There were 41 officers. There were 74 soldiers. There were 121 women. There were 74 children. And their number had grown by four babies who had been born on the voyage across the sea from Havana. These were the members of the Black Auxiliary Troops of King Carlos IV, remnants of the once mighty force commanded by Jean François Papillon, general of the armies of the Northern Plains against the French planters in the Grand Rivier region during what we would call, or what would become known as the Haitian Revolution. Now they were led by Maurice Calhoun Santiago, or Jean Jacques, as they knew. And they were ready to settle into their new lives under the provisions and promises that they expected from Jean-Francois' negotiations with the Spanish back in Havana. So who were these 300 plus people? Why were they now in this arguably backwater province on the Spanish Central American coast? How did they get there? What were they doing? It's questions like these that I will tend to give a little bit of illumination, and I can offer very little in the way of certainties, although as fellow scholars of La Diaspora Zunch, I have no doubt that I'm preaching to the choir here. What I will try to do, however, is present some background that can go a long way towards helping us reconcile and reimagine the practicalities and the essentials of these lives lived long ago. So in Tropio, Honduras, it seemed to be the ideal setting for the Black Auxiliaries, at least from a Spanish imperial point of view. The surrounding Misquitu Indians enjoyed hassling the Spanish settlements on the outskirts of Omoa and Tropio. And the British settlers in the north were never content with remaining on their side of the boundary. Spain looked forward to increasing their defensive and offensive might with an influx of soldiers fresh from the San Domingue Rebellion. And likewise, Trujillo and Amoa inhabitants had been pestering the Guatemalan municipal authorities for years to send them some slaves who could act as militia and who could schooner pilots among the mango shoals. Spain thought they had the complete package when they decided to use Trujillo as one of the resettlement zones. Juan Santiago's group arrived in Trujillo ready to establish themselves among the Spanish garrison community. The Guatemala city administrators, however, were not keen on honoring the promises from Jean Francois. The judicial court appointed a public prosecutor to look into the possibilities for using the Black Auxiliaries. And even though the Black troops had their own ideas about Spanish promises, these guarantees had been made in Havana. And the officials in the Guatemala Audiencia were not disposed to follow those recommendations. On March 31st, 1796, Prosecutor Gallegos suggested that the court follow three objectives. First, they needed to assist the Black families. Second, the court should make all possible use of the troops and any able men, and third, the Guatemalan Audiencia needed to avoid any problems that these Black Auxiliaries' opinions and conduct might cause to the rest of the community. Even though the group had fought for Spain, both on the right side, they needed to be treated like people coming from a country where there is plague and with whom no precaution is excessive. This reference to plague is obviously a nod to the San Domingue Slave Rebellion, fear of which was circulating in the Atlantic Empires. Although I've recently read some research that's going to maybe throw that into some fun little counter moves. It's interesting to note that even though Spain allied with the Black Auxiliaries, and the king awarded them a title from his own name, still local ministers were wary of these revolutionaries. The prosecutor's recommendations to the judiciary were concerned about safety for the existing trivial community, and to that effect, he proposed that all of the soldiers be relieved of their firearms, which would be donated to the local armory. He suggested that the community could form an all-French colony on the Macarmo River, which is the border of Honduras and Guatemala, and just to the north of the fort of Trujillo. 
However, it would, quote, be safer to disperse the officers and those who betrayed and send them into the interior cities and along the Pacific coast. He noted that if the black auxiliaries split up into smaller groups, they would be more likely to intermarry with the local inhabitants and thus pose less of a risk in terms of revolutionary rhetoric. By Batallez's recommendations continued on this theme of disbanding, uh, disbandment. He suggested that some of the soldiers could stay in Trujillo to help as a local militia, but that any good Christians, and that's a quote, could settle in Motagua as farmers in the River Valley, which was a more Latino and Spanish area. And he recommended that any man who became a sailor or a carpenter on a ship could continue to re receive a soldier's wage and rations, but he said nothing about maintaining all of their salaries as they had been promised. And most importantly, he said that none of the black auxiliaries should be sent to the Rio Pinto area near the Mesquito Indians, nor should they be allowed to settle on the island, island of Roatan. Both of these areas were British controlled, which shows yet again that the Guatemalan ministers were unsure about the loyalties of the black auxiliaries, and they would take no chance about an imperial change of alliance. Finally, the prosecutor reiterated that the black auxiliaries should not move to Omoa, even though the town had asked for help with their garrison, since the ministers were worried that the black troops would, quote, teach the San Domain path to liberty to those slave soldiers in the old port. To all of these recommendations, the Captain General and the Judicial Court eventually agreed, and Captain General Tomas Higai continued to try and disperse the group. Back in Trujillo, however, Juan Santiago and the Black Auxiliary community were not pleased. They were probably expecting a very different life than the one that was shaping up in the port town. Disasters and personal confrontations were not making the transition any easier. A raging fire had destroyed several houses in April, and the Spanish regular military decided to make the, the new inhabitants rebuild the houses. They were instructed to make the new homes out of adobe covered in tile, which was a painstaking process. The Spanish determined to give the labor to the newly arrived blacks since they assumed the black community had been sent there as laborers and this was necessary work to be done. Meanwhile, bad feelings had persisted from the shipboard trip as many of the families accused the sailors of stealing their belongings while sailing from Havana. The Trujillo commander, Avaloy, wrote to Captain, uh, the Captain General, Doma, on April 14th with news from the port, Avaloy, had examined the auxiliaries, as directed by the Guatemalan prosecutor, and he had dis discovered, quote, many problems. Juan Santiago was missing $400. He blamed the sailors because two handkerchiefs had been found on one of the sailors. This had sparked a vicious row with the Havana frigate commander and the Royal Armada lieutenant, Mantilla. Another headache for Havaloy, the black troops refused to part with their arms. It took two colonels and two captains, a four-hour discussion to get the troops to agree to house their 52 carbines and muskets in the regular armory, but they categorically refused to sell the arms in the event that they needed to use them, quote, in the service of the king. Havaloy was making every effort to collect all the pistols and knives, since these weapons were also prohibited in his city, so as to avoid, quote, mishaps. Per the march orders from the capital, Havaloy attempted to get the black auxiliary community to split up. However, they loudly refused to, to divide their group since, quote, General Juan Francois, who was in the court, told them back in Saint Domingue that they were to stick together. And the phrase in court was probably thought to carry, to carry weight with the local officials. The loudest remonstrations came from an adjutant general, Claudio, who was, quote, the most obstinate, which has always made me wonder what that Avaloy was also upset to discover that the black troops did not come with any laborer qualifications. Only four men claimed to be carpenters. Colonel Boudou claimed Mayor Marcial, Chatan, and Luis, and there was none with sailing experience, so nobody could sail the shoals as they had been expected. However, three officers did speak Spanish, and they acted as interpreters. Thus, in light of this census and further knowledge of the black troops' attitude, Trujillo officials reported that it might be best to keep them as a group, although far away from the slaves in Amala, but only after ridding the community of, quote, 
troublemakers, such as The Trujillo settlement was proving to take more adjustments than the black auxiliary community had originally anticipated. One of the Trujillo officials said that the auxiliaries found the fort repugnant. While back on San Domingue, the troops and their families must have looked forward to a new land with a new start, and since both Garcia and Jean Francois promoted their qualifications based on the soldiers' expertise, it must have come as a shock and confusion to discover that the local Trujillo officials wanted to take their guns away and force them to build houses. This was not the soldier farmer employment that Garcia prom promoted to the city officials. These local officials wanted to treat the black auxiliaries as slaves. Juan Santiago knew how to arbitrate this misunderstanding, and taking the knowledge gained from Jean Francois's arbitrations with Garcia and Las Casas, Santiago decided to go to the source. He and around 50 of the auxiliaries traveled to Guatemala City to plead their case before Captain General Jose Tomar. Even though Garcia, excuse me, even though Garcia had suggested to Las Casas that the black auxiliaries be reestablished somewhere as soldier farmers, especially given their 1793 land settlement agreement, that notation either did not make it to Guatemala's capital city, or more likely the ministers were not inclined to obey. The capital ministers still wanted to disperse the group, and the Mas sent out a number of requests to various other colonies around the coast. He petitioned the Mexican viceroy for help with expenses for resettlement. Originally, Mexico refused. Guatemala had already wrapped up de debts, and the viceroy hesitated to add to them. Tomas remarked to Las Casas that the 6,000 pesos in his treasury, were meant, which were meant for the Trujillo expenses, never actually made it there. I have a little note to myself that says, did Las Casas steal the money? <laughs> this seems like a petty amount based on the 100,000 pesos he had received from Madrid that were meant to go to Santo Domingo, but in that case also Las Casas decided to keep all of those funds for himself. Torguedos notes that this was in retaliation for Garcia sending him the black auxiliaries to deal with in the first place. However, I say there's no excuse for this thievery from Tomas. In any case, since the auxiliary's expense were only 715 pesos, Las Casas still made quite a profit, no matter. Let's turn our attention to Omoa. So while Tomas tried to find money for the black community's resettlement, none of the Spanish colonies had accepted the soldiers and their families into their towns. None except for Omoa, San Fernando de Omoa. It was the one place that the Guatemalan ministers did not want to send the troops. Omoa was similar to Trujillo in that it was a coastal town on the northern Honduras border. It was much closer to Belize, to British Honduras. However, it did not have a military regiment like Trujillo. The town did boast an elaborate stone fortress. Has anybody been there to Omoa's stone fortress? <laughs> yay, yay. <laughs> it had been built beginning in the 1750s, but the town officials continually sleep continually requested slave labor from the capital, and the arrival of the black auxiliaries was exactly what they wanted. Hernandez, the commander of Omoa, wrote to Tomas asking to be sent the black troops that had arrived at Trujillo. He argued that Omoa had some of the most fertile land in the world, and if Tomas would send them in there, everyone would be extremely happy. Everyone, that is, except for Trujillo, since that quote, serpent with the seven heads, was working to destroy the kingdom and its constitution. They do not have land, he said. Their situation is the most inappropriate in the world, and their livelihoods are, most, are more harmful than useful. Gonzalez's extravagant language gets away with him at times, although he makes his point quite clear. Omoa and Trujillo were historic trading competitors, and Gonzalez saw an opportunity to deplete Trujillo's slave labor while increasing the capital of this town and the Motagua region near the Spanish officials in charge, he argued, the black troops would not be dangerous. The soldiers would be stabilized by their families, and the homes and fields would provide security and an example to the local blacks. He argued, if the British could control their slaves, then so could the Spanish. The commander even offered to help with the settlement costs, offering money and oxen to build houses for them. The offer seemed perfect. 
Doug Thompson notes that one of the preferred applications for free people of color in Honduras, from the standpoint of Spanish administrators, was in the provincial militias that often served as the first line of defense in those colonies. This reflected long-standing pra practice in various parts of the Vice Royalty of New Spain and in Spanish America more generally. Omoa had long been receiving escaped slaves from British Honduras and putting them to work in the town and even in the militia. There was no reason to refuse Omoa's request. There was, however, one large fear. The black auxiliaries came from the revolutionary tur turmoil of San Domingue, and even though they had fought for this, the king and the Spanish king, no less, still Guatemalan officials feared their Republican rhetoric that could be spread to the Omoa slaves. I'm going to stop there. Using um, 
digitally dynamic medium. So I saw it to make an interactive map showing migration patterns of the black auxiliary troops as they left San Domingue was later to come Haiti to different destinations in the Atlantic world. In order to do that, I used GIS technology, which for those who are unfamiliar, GIS stands for Geographic Information Systems, and it's the technology that allows for representation of spatial data um, on computers, and it's the technology that allows things like GPS and Google Maps to function properly. Um, and that picture at the bottom is kind of a representation of how it works. You take layers of spatial data, they can show them on a map, and then you can kind of interpret it in new ways. And so um, we were using uh, the archives to track the locations of the Black Auxiliary troops, uh, their destinations, who they were with, what they ended up doing in their new homes throughout the um, time period after, during and after the Haitian Revolution. And in doing that, I put those locations, like their uh, modern coordinates, into GIS systems to create maps showing uh, over current boundaries where they ended up throughout the United world. And I also use a technology called Story Maps, which allows you to put these interactive digital maps into a textual narrative, which explains the full dynamic uh, migratory history of these men and their families. And so before I go into the actual creation of the maps and showing you kind of what they look like, I want to go into the historical context kind of of the Black Auxiliary troops and where they came from. So the story of the Black Auxiliary, um, as I said in the last presentation, starts in the Haitian Revolution, which began in 1791 um, with a general slave uprising in the French colony of Saint-Domingue. And several of the men who would become Black Auxiliary troops were leaders in that early revolution. In the top left is a man named George Biasu, who was one of the main generals of the well, one of the main leaders of this early slave uprising, and a man named Jean-Francois, who was featured heavily in the last presentation, and Toussaint Louverture, who would become the most famous hero of the Haitian Revolution, was at its initiation um, in the service of George Biasu. And so, in 1793, two years into the revolution, these men realized that they could form an alliance with the Spanish who ruled the neighboring colony of Santo Domingo, um, and were already at war with revolutionary France at this time, so the Spanish and these men formed a formal military alliance, which created the Black Auxiliary Troops of King Carlos IV of Spain. And this alliance, uh, in this alliance, the Spanish guaranteed the freedom, um, the freedom of these men, provided them with arms and salary in exchange for their help against the French in trying to reconquer the whole island of Hispaniola. Um, and so after the formation of this alliance, the Black Auxiliaries and the Spanish government enjoyed a series of great success against the French on the island. Um, and that lasted until around 1794, when Toussaint unexpectedly switched his allegiance and took his talents and his armies to the side of the French Republic. And this allowed for France to claim victory on the island, um, which led to the 1795 Treaty of Basel. This treaty forced Spain to cede the entire island of Hispaniola to France and included provisions that forced Spain to evacuate all of its military assets from the island, which included the Black Auxiliary troops. This evacuation uh, clause in the treaty led to some tensions between the Spanish government and the Black Auxiliary leaders, because the Spanish, who had to pay for all of these evacuations, did not want to take all of the troops out. They only wanted to take the highest ranking officers and send them to other locations. But the Black Auxiliary troops themselves did not want to be split up, because they knew that their numbers were the greatest leverage in order to keep their freedom and make the Spanish uh, deliver on the promises that they guaranteed. So they demanded that all of them be sent out from the island, not just the leaders. And in correspondences between the French government and the Spanish government at the time of the session of the colony, the French also wanted only the officers to be transferred out because the French wanted the hundreds of men who were fighting uh, under the Black Auxiliary leaders to remain on the island to be induced back to work on plantations. The French, by this time, had already abolished slavery, and they insisted that the men would remain as citizens and not um, as slaves, but it's most likely that they just wanted to have them there to continue labor on the sugar plantations on the island. And so before I move on, I want to speak to the notoriety that these men had and why it was so difficult to place them because of the fear that um, these armed revolutionary black men evinced throughout the Atlantic world. So the first a uh, quote I have on here is from a man named M. Gross, who was a French lawyer in San Domingue at the beginning of the Haitian Revolution, and he was captured um, very early on. He wrote a first-hand account of his time, and so he said, from the well-known character of this Negro general, referring to George Biasu, I was fully persuaded that he would be disposed to nothing peaceable, and this kind of speaks to the 
reputation that George Biasu had gained, even this early in the revolution, as particularly brutal and violent. Uh, man, whether or not that was justified is a different question, but that is the reputation he has, and it did inspire a lot of fear in the colonial governments. Likewise, um, when the French were negotiating with the Spanish over the session of the of island of Hispaniola, they made specific reference to Jean-Francois, who was the highest ranking general. Um, they specifically asked for him to be removed because they knew the kind of power he had and the represented danger to their colonial interests. And so when Spain had to take these, these men and their family to resettle into other places, it made it very difficult uh, to find places that were willing to take them because everyone was so scared of these men who had just led the largest slave uprising in the history of the world. And they had a lot of slave colonies, so there was a lot of infamy going into that. But after the Treaty of Athens in 1995, they were relocated. And so this map uh, is showing kind of an overview of where they ended up going. So from, from San Domingue, which is where the green dot kind of is, they were uh, the governor of San Domingue at the time, Joaquin Garcia, sent them to Havana, where he hoped they could be resettled. But the governor of Cuba, uh, Las Casas, did not want any of these men even setting foot in his colony because it was a slave island. He refused to let them even off the boat. And so he said he tried to send John Francois and his men originally to Trinidad, but the governor of Trinidad also refused to accept them. Again, it was also a slave colony. So he ended up splitting the party, which was around approximately 700 people, into different groups. And he sent, so he sent John Francois and uh, around 140 of his people to Cadiz, which is in southern Spain, against the direct wishes of the Spanish crown. And he split up the rest of the party into different locations such as the Mosquito Coast, which is covered in detail in the last presentation, as well as Panama and the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. And George B. Asu and his much smaller party were sent to Florida. Um, and that experience is covered in much detail by Dr. Landers here. Um, and so I'm kind of going to walk through some of these migrations and kind of tell what happened. So, so the first, General Jean-Francois, who's referred to as Juan Francisco in the Spanish records, uh, he was the highest ranked of the Black Auxiliary officially, and he was sent, like I said, to Cadiz in southern Spain. And Cadiz was the center of imperial commerce for the Spanish Empire with the West Indian colonies. And so when he got there, he came into almost immediate conflict with the government. Um, one of the conflicts was with the Catholic Church, who felt that he was not a true Christian because um, they felt that he was not officially married to the women that he was living with, and they accused his whole party of that crime. And so they felt that he was not actually Catholic and worthy of this treatment. And they also found, they also claimed that there were discrepancies in documentation of his title as general. And so they stripped him of that title and then thus reduced his salary accordingly. And so he was in all this conflict with Spain, and they came to an agreement in 1796 for him to be sent to the Mosquito Coast and present day Guatemala to rejoin the bulk of his men who had been sent there before. However, this plan never actually ended up coming to fruition, and even by 1802, which is six years later, he was still trying to get there and sending letters to his companions there, but he would die in Spain without ever being able to carry out that plan. Um, George Biasu uh, ended up on a much shorter journey going to St. Augustine in Spanish Florida, and when he arrived in Spanish Florida, and 1795, he was at the time the highest ranked black person in the history of that colony with the title of general. And he also came to conflict in the conflict with the uh, colonial government there because he claimed he felt that he was not getting the respect he deserved as a Spanish war hero. Um, he felt that he was disrespected. And he also came to conflict with the governor of Florida at the time who resented that Biasu, who was a black man and a former slave, made a salary paid for by the crown almost as high as his own. And so they came into conflict, but as there was already a relatively large free black population in San Augustine at the time, they were able to integrate into that community um, a little bit. But he did have conflicts that he wanted to leave, and he wanted to be able to bring his mother over from San Domingue, but those also were never able to happen. And lastly, in terms of journeys, I included a story of a man named Louis Buck, who was a commandant under Jean-Francois de Saint-Domingue. And this letter is from the governor of Saint-Domingue. Uh, it, it was uh, commending his exceptional service and loyalty in the war. But in the evacuation from the island, 
Lewis Club and some of his companions, around seven of them, were in a shipwreck and their ship ended up drifting for months and they ended up in Georgia where they were accused of murdering the white ship captain and they were sent to St. Augustine for a murder trial. However, they did not have enough evidence to convict them there, so they sent them to back to Havana for further processing and the seven men split up to different locations. And Lewis Buck ended up being sent to Colombia, like present day Colombia, and he was the only one of the Buck authorities that we know of right now to have been sent there. And as these men wanted to stay together and leverage their numbers as much as possible, this was not an ideal scenario for him. And so some kind of way he found a way to meet up with his companion from the ship who was sent to Venezuela, and together they arrived to rejoin the group that had been earlier sent to Panama, and they ended up settling into that community. And the picture on the right is a fort in Panama where they would have been stationed, and they would have been expected to fight um, Native American groups that were hostile to Spanish interests in the region. In the region. And that was in line with the general philosophy of where these men ended up were remote peripheral territories in the Spanish Empire, where their military talents would be useful as they just fought a war against France, but there was not large slave populations that could be incited to rebellion. And so, for me, the importance of this research was that a lot of the existing scholarship um, of the migration out of San Domingue during the war does favor a lot of the white perspective because that's what a lot of written sources are, um, that's true wrote a lot of the written sources that have survived. And this is a picture I took on a recent trip to Philadelphia um, at the Liberty Bell Museum where they talk about kind of the exodus from San Domingue, but it does heavily favor the perspective of the slave owning class in San Domingue and their slave and like their uh, relation to property law. And it also showed the ability of black people to navigate complex systems of empire and that they were not always just slaves and victims within these imperial systems, but they were able to often turn competing empires against each other and eke out their own um, spheres of safety and existence when necessary. And I also think it's important as a military and like veterans type of history, because the reason why they're able to be tracked is because of the military records that we had and like the salary they're paid and those kind of things that allow for their names to be coming up over and over again in the records. And I think it talks to kind of the relationship between the government and the military in terms of promises. And I think um, tying it to kind of present day issues when the US has just left Afghanistan, um, we did have agreements with certain Afghan groups who were serving as interpreters and other things. We made promises and those have still not often been carried out. And when American troops left, there are still some Afghans left there. I think it's a similar type of thing where there's promises between a strong global power and these marginalized groups that are seeking to use it to their own advantage. And so I'd like to thank Dr. Jane Landers and Daniel Jenkins again for all the support that I had with them over the summer. And I'd also like to thank the Legion of Alliance and Dr. Don Brunson for their support of me during this time as well. And thank you all for your time.
blackness and the making of the African Republic, 1865 to 1912, has come out. And it's a study that explores continuity and immutability in black experience of freedom, citizenship, and nationhood across the Atlantic world. It was published by Cambridge University Press, May 2019. Highly recommended. So much, Jane. Uh, it's so nice to be back here uh, at Vanderbilt, uh, my old stomping ground. Um, just to mark the occasion, I park illegally. I was telling somebody uh, earlier, back in the old days when I was here, I parked for two years illegally at Black Buster uh, before they put a message on my car. <laughs> But it's so great to see so many old faces. Also, I have not kicked the soccer ball since I left Vanderbilt. <laughs> I, really, I really miss us playing in the morning. Um, Dr. Tiffany Patterson, um, Dane, of course, my advisor who stopped me, Kroger's in traffic for chapters of my dissertation, <laughs> and you know, um, so many others of you who have had such a good time um, with while well, being here. So thank you so very much I, um, for the introduction, Jane. I'm excited to share this work that was, you know, so much of it was uh, completed here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the book project, um, which I conceived of as a, as a microhistory set in motion by the stories of uh, 50 Afro-Barbadians um, families, uh, approximately 46. Um, Migrants. Uh, you can see, uh, maybe Dr. Beckett has some family members um, you can see on the list here. Um, and so, um, in this presentation, I want to highlight how, uh, tra as transnational blackness and diasporic hegemony shaped the Liberian nation building project, black migrant investment in and rehearsals of the mythologies of colonialism and whiteness became a feature that fractured the project. Now, Liberia was not prepared to accommodate the fullness of blackness, even as it was, became known as a black republic. At its founding in the 1820s by the American Colonization Society, the colony only attended to one group of blacks, African Americans. However, with independence, internal pressures, and global developments, the nation progressively opened itself to others. The black nationalist, Alexander Cromwell, thereafter issued a call for all blacks in the diaspora to come to Liberia. Quote, for myself, I formally invite the Barbadians, Jamaicans, Sierra Leoneans, as well as Americans to this common heritage of the Negro. As the emigrant commissioner of, the New, of New York greets the Germans, Italians, Swedes, English, and Irish who arrived at the port in hundreds and thousands, and thus every year swelled the already vast population of the Great Republic of America. With this invitation framed in the language of black unity and equality, black migrants of different backgrounds and circumstances came to view migration to Liberia as an escape from white supremacist and colonial oppression and made their way there, expecting to be embraced under a national canopy of blackness. The Liberian Republic became a national respect for receptacle for the deeply held aspirations of the African diaspora and a prescription for their historical traumas. With the desires within and scrutiny without, Liberia gradually came to be viewed as a state held together by blackness. But even with this racial guarantee, black nationalist migrants who had dreamt of escaping to a black Zion 
were prompted by the possibility of Liberia collapsing into a gaggle of fractious tribes. The piercing gaze of white seemingly sealed Liberia's fate and made the anxieties only more worse. Given the elevated stakes, the Liberia could accept ordinary migrants. However, defining blackness at the level of the presidency required a level of exceptionality that unavoidably set in motion a revelatory process. Given the prompt nature of such leadership decisions, uneasy would be the head who wore the crown of the Negro Republic. In an editorial published in the aftermath of the 1903 presidential election campaign, J.A. Tuning, a teacher in the Key Thomas Methodist Episcopal Church Common School, exposed the realities behind the feelings that had settled into the idea of Liberia. Quote, the next important event that shall claim the undivided attention of the entire nation is the induction into office of the newly elected president. But then Tulin, Tulin mockingly inquired, who is this man and from whence comes he to rule? It was his confident assessment that this is the quarrel going on in the circles, realms, and claiming the attention of the most thoughtful Liberians whose interest in Liberia is most absorbing. Such queries were expected as part of the discussions accompanying the seriousness and grandiosity of a presidential election. But as students gathered in the chatter about the president-elect, what many found newsworthy had little to do with his past with, with, had little to do with past misdeeds or his previous appointment as, quote, the head of the financial department in Liberia. Instead, what was deemed odd was that the newly elected leader had, quote, come not from the land of our forefathers' nativity to fill the exalted post of the executive chair. Through, subject, uh, through subjection to scrutiny in gossip, the primacy of the new president's heritage highlighted electoral expectation and indexed the terms of his othering. Tudor was right. Up until the turn of the century, all of Liberia's leaders were of American heritage. White American colonizationists who created the colony governed until independence in 1847. Though all subsequent Liberian presidents had been African American migrants, the ACS maintained its hegemony in a nominally independent Liberia that co-opted rather than transformed previous power dynamics. In the aftermath of the 1903 election campaign, Arthur Barclay, pictured there on your screen, a migrant from the British Caribbean colony of Barbados, who emerged as the winner, became the first variant in Liberia's then 50-year presidential history. Given the magnitude of the election changes wrought by, um, given the magnitude of changes wrought by the election, the inquiries of the pioneering American Liberian community gatekeepers might have been born out of sheer curiosity. After all, Afro Barbadians had arrived at the political negotiating table in Liberia with little more than the charm of being Victorian Negroes. Yet the inquiries also acted as a referendum that would unwittingly reveal emerging Liberian ethics. Indeed, if Barclay, as a migrant himself, was voted president of a country created for blacks, why was his election perceived as strange? Arthur Barclay's presidential controversy played out on the Liberian national stage, but it recalled decisions put in motion years before. Only four years old in 1865, when his father, Anthony Barclay, made up his mind to leave Barbados with his family of 13 and nearly 333 others, Arthur Barclay had yet to imagine a future as president of a nation. If anyone harbored those dreams, it was his father. Going against the public feelings of an era when black oppression seemed absolute and unchallengeable, the elder Barclay had imagined himself as the future ruler of a Negro nation. In the 1840s, then, Anthony Barclay had suffered years of failure in advocating for post-slavery reforms in Barbados before he even considered leaving. He had hoped to convince the British monarchy that he and members of his middle class were loyal subjects who were fit for and deserving of their rights. 
In the midst of increasing white backlash against post-emancipation reform, an anonymous writer working under the pen name Africanus wrote to the editor of The Liberal, a local newspaper, to suggest that Afro-Barbadians should broaden their horizons. The mysterious Africanus might have even outed himself as Barclay when he posed this question, quote, if political equality is denied to us in the land which gave us birth by those whom rest the power to bestow it, how are we to obtain it? On the one hand, Africanus suggested that Afro-Barbadians fight their way, quote, as braver spirits among us are doing, bringing all our moral energies to the good work. However, in another breath, he demanded that they seek it on, quote, other and more auspicious shores, leaving behind the land of our birth, that land which is dear to our hearts, to be tilled by the tyrants who claim it as their own. As Africanus refrained of finding more auspicious shores animated post-slavery life, it increasingly functioned to reset the limits and imaginative post-emancipation horizons of Barclay and other like-minded Barbadians. Reacting to his discontent with the determination to fulfill his post-emancipation dreams, Barclay set his sights directly across the ocean to Liberia. Though on a distant shore, Liberia felt much closer to the Barbadians. The Atlantic, that once shark-filled gulf that swallowed up the bodies of chained Africans, did not appear so horrifying as to render crossing it a foolish decision. With the abolition of slavery and the emergence of Liberia as a possible alternative, the ocean appeared as a bridge drawn across two shorelines united by sheer concerns about the future of blackness. But this was not just filled in by imagination shaped by exchanges of black newspapers in the Caribbean and the USA. Their desires were defined by real experiences. J.J. Roberts, for instance, an African-American migrant from Virginia who had served as Liberia's first president, had visited Barbados in 1848. African-Americans also, um, who were, you know, were en route to Liberia, had stopped over in Barbados to the spectacle of crowds. So following these visits, staring across the vast ocean filled Barclay with the belief that he too could one day become the governor of a Negro Republic. And having made up his mind to move there, Barclay and others realized that their dreams of an emigration could not be achieved without foreign aid. And this would bring the Barbadians to the American Colonization Society, the organization in the USA that had created Liberia as a colony for African Americans. Now, Barbadians' longstanding interest in Africa proved valuable in approaching the American Colonization Society. Through institutions such as the Barbados Colonization Society for assisting in the suppression of the slave trade and introduction of civilization into Africa, and the Pongas missions, Barbados had had a long time in supporting missionary ventures in hopes of serving as colonial agents of British abolition, civilizing, and imperialism. British royalism appealed to many Afro-Barbadians after emancipation. As Barbadians of the lower classes migrated to Demerara and St. Croix and other new frontiers in search of higher wages, those like Barclay, having enjoyed years of post-emancipation freedom, were seduced by the possibilities of serving as representatives in the British imperial bureaucracy in places like Sierra Leone and other colonies in Africa. An awareness of imperial uh, post-emancipation possibility also mapped out more auspicious shores where Barbadians like Barclay could envision a different future. From Barbadians' early interest in Africa, two immigration movements emerged. Anthony Barclay steered one group, serving as the chairman of the Fatherland Union, Barbados Immigration Society, while James T. Weil served as secretary of the Barbados Company for Liberia. Unlike African Americans, however, who had ready access to Liberia through the American Colonization Society, the Barbadians were forced to take a different route in order to make their immigration a reality. As Barbadians' interest in African immigration turned to an eagerness to flee the island in the 1860s, 
Joseph Wallace turned to uh, Atwell, who had left Barbados to study at the Divinity um, um, Institute, study Divinity at the Institute for Colored Youth in Philadelphia. But due to a desperation of his friends, he quickly became their immigration agent. And so jolted into action in December 1864, Atwell, in a letter to the American Colonization Society, communicated the Barbadians' interests and concerns. Invoking aid on behalf of the company, he conveyed, he conveyed their urgent appeal in aid of immigration from Barbados to Liberia. He noted, quote, were a free passage provided, several hundreds of worthy and industrious Barbadians would gladly and immediately seek the attractive shores of the African Republic. As chairperson of the Fatherland Union, Barclay knew over 300 other Barbadians who were interested in immigrating to Liberia. With concerns about respectability, he had chosen the potential migrants from artisans and professionals like himself who had, who had come from the political elite and socially mobile Afro-Barbadian middle class. For the ACS, a letter from the Barbadians was uncommon but not entirely surprising. Since launching in 1816, they had shuffled through piles of requests, begging for some kind of assistance to immigrate to Liberia, but most exclusively, almost exclusively from African Americans. Hardly any letters were from black people outside of the United States, let alone British colonial Barbadians, widely thought to be the most loyal of all the West Indians. Having earned the reputation as, quote, the gem of all the British Isles, travelers through the Atlantic world regularly mocked Barbados' loyalty by referring to the island as, quote, a little London and the provincial county of Bimshire. Given the standing, the Barbadians' letter was truly an audacious move. Clearly, the expectations of loyalty could not blunt the imaginations of British subjects like Barclay when post-emancipation shortcomings familial aspirations, political goals, and racial consciousness helped him to conceptualize opportunities across the Atlantic landscape. Yet surely the ACS must have wondered, why were Barbadians, who were the treasured members of the British Empire, interested in migrating to Liberia, an American colony termed Independent Republic, instead of the nearby British colony of Sierra Leone? The Barbadians, who were new migrant terrain, were new migrant terrain for the American colonization society, but by time, by the time their letter was received, it would become useful propaganda to attract more black people to Liberia. Indeed, the ACS boasted in its journal, the African Repository, that quote, a spirit of immigration is reportedly in existence in St. Kitts, Demerara, St. Thomas, and other islands of the West Indies. Through their published letter, the Barbadians explained that they desired to immigrate to Liberia for two specific reasons. Quote, one being the improvement of their condition by diligent labor, and two, the noble desire of assisting to elevate their fatherland or building up a nationality without which they consider their race can never attain their proper position in the family of nations. End of quote. With their letter, the Barbadians appeared to be both the typical and unusual prospective Liberian immigrants. Unlike many African Americans still enslaved in the United States, Barbadians who were already free were able to sketch out a future where they imagined their labor, uh, using their labor to build up a republic for the purpose of increasing black racial respectability. Drawing together the commonalities of black racial identity that elevated the goals of race, the Barbadians proposed a black freedom that supposedly included advancement for themselves, Liberia, and other black people. Although the Barbadians initially struggled in their quest to immigrate to Liberia, their interests boded well in the heady 1860s. The American Civil War had not only created a decline in financial support for the ACS, but had also caused waning African American interest in Liberian immigration. Yet all the while, concerns grew that Liberia needs an intelligent and productive population. And so gripped with fear of a possible failure of their colonization scheme, the ACS had begun to look for solution elsewhere when Edward Wilmot Lydon, a Liberian migrant from the British Virgin Islands, suggested that West Indians might fill the immigration void. 
1862, when Leiden returned to the Caribbean to circulate a pamphlet addressed to, quote, the descendants of Africa throughout the West Indian islands. Liberian officials began to lure West Indians across the Atlantic, viewing their interests as mutually beneficial. In a period in which a fractured African diaspora began to see Liberia with one vision, Blighton, black nationalists, and Pan African motifs connected with the Barbadians' post slavery frustrations and interest in efforts to civilize Africa. Berkeley's subsequent appropriation of Liberian officials' rhetoric firmly planted Afro-Barbadian desires in the very essence of colonizationist goals. Thus, mutual Pan-African desires to, quote, build up a nationality brought together both parties in the cult of civilizing that come, had come to be regarded as the central mission of the ACS in Liberia. Up to this point, all the stars were aligned to make the Barbadians immigration to Liberia possible. With the declining interest of African Americans and the Barbadians growing interest, the ACS members were left with what appeared to be a simple decision. But they had yet another concern, the same one that Tune would point out nearly 40 years later during Arthur Barclay's presidential election. A clause in the 1816 ACS Constitution had outlined their objectives as solely an effort to exclusively colonize the free people of color residing in our country, meaning the United States. The Barbadians clearly fell outside the purview and early aims um, of the early aims of the ACS. But by 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation would begin to foster feelings of hopefulness about life in the United States among African Americans, who would then shift their focus away from Liberian immigration to a post-Civil War future in the United States. And with this, the ACS would ultimately revise that clause in their constitution to secure the Barbadians as potential migrants. Ultimately, this change brought together the Barbadians' interest in fleeing the Caribbean with the ACS's mission to increase Liberia's civilized and productive population. Now, after 34 days of travel, sighting the African coast gave the Barbadian migrants some reason to look towards their future. As the shoreline of the Liberian coast rose to meet the arrival of the Bricora, uh, Bricora's Barbadian passengers, he seemingly, the seemingly uh, irredeemably conflict-rated Caribbean fell away as they looked toward the new frontiers of freedom and their desires for a better life that lay ahead. Upon arrival, Barclay and the other Barbadians joined a broad cross-section of uh, black migrants who had arrived in Liberia under varying conditions of freedom. This included African Americans and African captives who were liberated from slave ships, African indigenous of various ethnicities who were themselves migrants who had long lived in the area before European arrival to trade grains and then later slaves. So with the Barbadian arrival, four groups with four different experiences of oppression and brutality shaping their path to Liberia, meant to envision a common future. West Indians, African Americans, African recaptives, and indigenous collided in the Liberian nation building project, making the West African coast a black multicultural space of multiple voices and visions. Barbadians' arrival in Liberia proved momentous, but if they found their unusual um, environmental, uh, social environment to be worrisome, their ambiguous political status created even more alarm. The Barbadian cohort arrived in a Liberian Republic where African American migrants turned American Liberians controlled the politics. The American Liberian president, who I mentioned earlier, Joseph Jenkins Roberts, who had migrated from Virginia, anxiously observed the 1865 arrival of the 346 Barbadians with this, quote, heretofore we had now and then a family or two to arrive from the British West Indies, but nearly all after a while make a visit to Sierra Leone, and in most cases finally settle there where the manners and customs of the people are more English, and of course are more adapted to their early habits and tastes. Perhaps Robert's conscious facility
hostility to the migrants, non-Republican political ideology was rooted in the agitation of the British and their encroachment um, on the uh, on the Liberian coast. And this, you know, was provoked by you know the West Indians' presence. By politically distinguishing the West Indians from their African American counterparts, Roberts admitted that their different political legacy would disrupt the communalism that Liberia had forged through black racial identity. Roberts suggested that the Barbadian migrants might have inherited and carried a fidelity to the British system of monarchy that migration had not extinguished and thus might prove disruptive to the black Republican experiment. After all, migrant British colonial Barbadians were in many ways very similar to African Americans, reflecting the overlapping layers of identity making in Liberia. As royalist imperial subjects, the Barbadians appeared as a threat to the veracity of the African American uh, Republican experiment. With an acute awareness of the political implications of the Barbadians' presence, the former president set aside his fears as he attempted to remain optimistic. Roberts hoped that at, as the largest group of West Indians to have settled in the Republic, quote, perhaps this company, being a large number, and forming themselves in a neighborhood, as I understand it, proposed settling pretty much together in St. Paul, in Harrisburg, in Roosevelt, would keep them in Liberia. But Roberts also sensed that the Barbadians' political dislocation in Republican Liberia and understood the implications for the migrants and the state. As such, he prayed that they would, quote, gradually slide into our Republicans' feelings and sentiments and soon find themselves entirely identified with this country. If so, as I think most likely, these people with the blessings of Providence will doubtless prove a great acquisition to Liberia. In the process, what had been considered crucial distinctions between the different forms of government were deliberately papered over as, um, as, it, as it continued to generate tension. Now, um, I'll try to end here. Um, as a spirit of Pan-Africanism and black national solidarity and the common experience of racial oppression in diaspora had been the unifying forces for African Americans and West Indians. However, in a knowledge doubt labor, would this transatlantic transition to a black nation yield feelings of inclusion? The migrants' embrace of Liberia and its much heralded end to the artificial borders imposed by slavery, imperialism, and diaspora led to unintended consequences. Whereas the struggle in the diaspora was between races, the arrival of the various migrant streams in Liberia created a new milieu that nurtured interracial rivalry among ethnic identities and um, the, the, that different groups of, uh, of black migrants who had come into the Republic. As disparate strangers gathered under the umbrella of the nation state, Liberia both dissolved the issues of diaspora and magnified them. Distance had created a mirage of simple unity, it seemed. The real differences became pronounced upon arrival when experience replaced rhetoric thus challenging the process that creation, created racial identities. After settling, each group uh, um, would, would operate within their own networks and the traditions, um, align with each other, and this would create the, the, the dynamics with that would determine um, um, othering, um, difference, and um, designations of citizenship and inclusion in the nation. Thank you so much.
and it chronicled the military tactics deployed by the British Royal Army after the Revolutionary War that facilitated the migration of free people of color to Trinidad in the years leading up to the American Civil War. While our research is centered on histories of migration, transnationalism, and gendered labor, Danielle's teaching deploys an intersectional approach to understanding historical contexts and social constructs that serve to advantage and disadvantage different groups of people. Her classes on womanism in global context and black American migration uh, have Danielle striving to bring the voices and experiences of marginalized people to the forefront by placing historical critiques in conversation with broader cultural commonalities. Danielle? And as I was pulling 
together these, these newspapers and these clippings, I came across a series of advertisements encouraging immigration. And this is how the thought of it from working on emerges. So the spring of 1840, Baltimoreans flipping through the pages of the Baltimore Sun, caught a glimpse of advertisements announcing free transportation and passage aboard first-class vessels departing Baltimore Harbor, Maryland, from Port of Spain, Canada. Amongst numerous, numerous advertisements targeted specifically for cheap goods, ladies' hats, mineral water, and amid a runaway slave announcements. Baltimore into an old read captions advertising free travel to British Canada. Although these immigration advertisements appeared indiscriminately for all Baltimore to see, they were targeted specifically for free, industrious persons of color, who were both laborers, agriculturalists, and families. So even with abolition of slavery in the British Caribbean had been slipped by in 1834, the demand for agricultural labor on plantation states was high. In an effort to satiate these labor demands and mobilize a large number of black Americans to agree, Trinidad's colonial legislature appointed William Burley Burnley, a plantation owner from Trinidad, to serve as an immigration agent of the island. Furthermore, the colonial legislature also enacted a series of immigration ordinances, affixing bounties and in order to to encourage people to black Americans to immigrate. But interestingly, interestingly enough, Burnley first contributed his efforts on mobilizing and recruiting black people, not from the United States, but from Canada. So Trinidad and planters briefly considered recruiting European and white American immigrants. However, a high rate of mortality amongst recent arrivals from England and Wales quickly dissuaded them and to consider other potential immigrants. And in doing so, Governor Trinidad had included, uh, attempted to rationalize the high rate of European natural mortality as a biological incompatibility of white laborers to the tropical climate. So McLean attempted to then insist that white laborers did not have the constitutions or exposure for tropical sun. So collectively, the high mortality followed by this desertion of hundreds of Europeans from plantations solidified the planters' position that they need to continue to search for field labor elsewhere. So turning to Canada and turning to the Northeastern United States, uh, Trinidad, Trinidad's governor and colonial office created a series of attempts to recruit black Americans. So even though their early attempts, experiments to recruit people from Europe failed, the horizon was still open. Nova Scotia's Lieutenant Governor Colin Campbell, in a moment, blamed economic shortcomings that Nova Scotia was experiencing all these black refugees, these black refugees and their descendants who, who were relocated to Preston and Hamilton Ham Plains, Nova Scotia, after the War of 1812. And they themselves, as descendants, were facing intense racism, unemployment, and difficulty in their ability to acquire land. So, Campbell says, look, Nova Scotia is not climatically adaptable for these refugees. And he thinks that these refugees in turn could prosper by moving somewhere else. So his language that he uses that I analyze in the administration kind of emphasizes the biological incompatibility of refugees with the closest climate, while thereby affirming the underlying, underlying belief that black Nova Scotians were inferior to white Nova Scotians. So it was Campbell's opinion that the descendants of these refugees and free people of color, free people of color could gain a greater sense of identity, adaptability, access to land, by resettling Trinidad. So considering it to be a much more temperate region. So he considered Trinidad's climate and receptiveness would allow for people of color to obtain an improved standard of living, an opportunity to educate their children, and gain greater access to employment. So while Campbell shared his opinions and urged his contemporaries to consider removing refugees from the region again to Trinidad, Trinidad's colonial legislator initiated a second attempt to encourage migration to the island. With an established rapport between the colonial governments um, and a tradition of refugees already immigrating from Canada to Trinidad, Burnley considered Nova Scotia as a reasonable location to commence his recruiting efforts. Um, after recruiting, he commenced his recruiting efforts at, in the aftermath of the British uh, expedition. So together, Trinidad's plan, along with support from the colonial officials of Nova Scotia and Trinidad, sought to re-implement an immigration scheme that would, that would serve Nova Scotia the logic that they had in Nova Scotia as a racially, black Nova Scotia were racially inferior, inferior, and therefore economically dependent on the region. Just the five reasons why they should be moved and relocated to Trinidad. So Burnley in turn publishes a series of incentives and announcements throughout newspapers in the Northeastern North United States, making promises of permanent employment, of high wages, and he even offered public meetings, events, describing the illustrious, just offering these illustrious descriptions 
pictures of Iowa Trail. Even listed vessel departures back in the newspapers throughout the most of the United States, including the Baltimore Sun, the Final Palm, the Anglo American, and the Color Red Color Out Loud, the Color Mario. So as I was like, thinking about this particular project stemming from the distribution, I said, all right, let me focus on my energy attention on mention specifically in these ads of immigration, migration, migrant obituaries, letters, um, and reference to West Indian emancipation, both in Trinidad and British Guyana. So this product that kind of emerges from this context is I, again, sorting through all my many, 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 many PDFs um, to organize each of these different newspaper excerpts by date and region. Then I'm in the process of transcribing each of the particular excerpts and then standardizing that content of the data to then input into a mega X, to then digitally create an exhibit of each digital newspaper collection, thereby making the newspaper excerpts available through a mega X, publicly accessible and searchable. So the project attempts to accomplish two objectives as a whole, to further contextualize not only environmental, economic, and local forces that motivated migration, but also to place newspaper excerpts in conversation with one another. So through the obituaries, through the family letters, through the announcements, we're able to see the insight as to what those migrants were feeling, how they were responding to moving to the different contexts, and therefore kind of more tangibly be able to justify their motivations for moving recently. And this then becomes a way of facilitating greater understanding of our point of view. So collectively, my plan and my hope as I can move through this next phase of my analysis is then to analyze passage of the vessel manifest and their departures. In order, to bring, in order to gain greater clarity in how these movement patterns are unfolding as people are going from Baltimore, New York, uh, and New York and Philadelphia, and then be able to trace these mass movements over time. I envision that situating the study, right, the dissertation itself, along with the analysis from the digital project within uh, specific migration to Trinidad between 1840 and 1861 as one small component of much broader hemispheric migratory movement from the United States to the British Caribbean, thereby contributing to this ongoing flux movement of migration, not just from the Caribbean to the United States, but this movement from the United, from the United States to the British Caribbean in particular. And this then helps us understand these diasporic movements, but also how people are adjusting to the push and pull forces that are surrounding them. And then the more complicating afro diaspora paradigm between the homeland and their host society. That's it.
Rachel for being here, and thank you, Jane, for the call-up to my introduction, my presentation. So I'm going to present Anarchistas y Cuadreros, the deportation of Abacua Society members to Fernando Po. Cuban demography basically descends from two transatlantic geographical enclaves the Iberian Peninsula and the African continent. The settlement of Spaniards began in Cuba in the 16th century. During the second half of the 18th century, the entry of African slaves to the island increased, although the traffic dates to the second half of the 16th century. The plantation system catalyzed the massive supply of labor essential for sugar production, leaving behind practices of protection and humanization of slaves. It was necessary to constantly replace the dying slave, which led to the increased importation of labor to sustain the business. As a result, the enslaved African became another gear in the sugar production process. This image by La Plante, Ingenio El Narciso, is an idyllic representation of the sugar mill. The testimony by Juan Francisco Manzano, for example, the enslaved poet, depicts the Ingenio, the sugar mill, as an arid and dry place. As you can see, these palm trees, all the green in the landscape, suggest more the Garden of Eden. Between 1790 and 1865, the importing of slaves in Cuba amounted to 600,000 in total. The 1841 population census shows the following statistics. You can see in my slide. 498,000 enslaved, 162,000 free people of color and 440,000 whites, Comisión de Jefes y Oficiales. The sustained exportation of African slave labor caused a drastic increase in the black population on the island. Both the slave's way of life and their religious practices were altered. The latter could point to the nullification of the original fate of the enslaved, but the opposite happened. The enslaved fused their religious practices, the African component and the Spanish Catholic faith. The public converts that never discarded their original beliefs commune with the Catholic Church, embraced baptism and mass. They coded the African deities into Christian icons, as happened, for example, with the Virgin of Santa Barbara, who was related to the warrior god Chango, based on the legacy of an ancient Dahomeyan king. Apart from this camouflage, the enslaved and their descendants kept the ritual brooms, ancestral garments, they practiced their group worship under the structure of the Cabildo de Nación, nation groups, and the cofradías, confraternities. Both congregations in the style of African brotherhoods permitted by the colonial government. The economic social relations generated in Cuba during the colonial period favored the appearance of fraternal groups and or brotherhood of various kinds. The Abacua Society was one of these groups, recognized and as an expression of a different discourse. This gave way to their desires, needs, and aspirations of otherness without abandoning their core beliefs. As a result, they developed hybrid practices that contributed to an expression of a national identity, a uniquely Afro-Cuban one. The first evidence of the existence of the Aqua Society dates from 1834 to 1836, when the enslaved of the Caraballi nation, coming from 
the HP Society Lover group under the name of Apapa Efi and founded the first potencia, Abapua group, known as a Fiuton or a Fiuton for their Creole descendants in the town of Regla. The Abapua Society, an esoteric brotherhood of magical religious fenomenos, was created as a group for mutual help and protection, in which funds are also gathered and allocated to assist the brothers. In addition, it fostered free membership and it was a secret organization. An informant from Lydia Cabrera's research expressed his dissatisfaction with the researcher's emphasis on the secret aspect of the society above other attributes, although the, he recognizes the rights and the private space. In a nutshell, number, no members of the society cannot understand legends, symbols, and other aspects. Tato Quiñones maintained that many years ago the organization abandoned its secrecy. The members of the potencias, popularly known as Ñanigos, for the little devil or Ireme, also known as Ñaña, or Nanyu, must love and serve each other as brothers and keep the most absolute reserve regarding the cult of Ekwe and the hermetic rites of the brotherhood. This is the first commitment they make when they begin the initiation process. From its inception, the society was established as an association for men. Almost all the members survived for my thesis agree that the society has a strict presence regarding manhood, and Abacua must be a good friend, a good husband, and a good father. Take care of the mother and their children, and above all, be loyal to your Ecobios, brothers of faith. Fraternity is the fundamental present precept of the Abacua. The political power of the Abacua was not overlooked in colonial times. Like Freemasonry, the fraternal character of the society conditioned the mentality of the Spanish authorities on the island. As a fraternal organization, it immediately fell into the same category as Masons known as conspiradores, conspirators, and anarchistas, anarchists. Despite the existence of, the existence of white potencias, the Arapua society was composed mainly of Afro-Cubans. Therefore, in addition to the two qualifiers mentioned above, conspirators and anarchists, they fell into the category of Afro-Cuban thieves. Since its foundation, the society embraced marginality and violence as identities within the social process. In the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, the popular consciousness was marked by the idea of the Abacua as someone who behaved improperly and was on the periphery and subsequently was stereotyped as an outlaw. According to Lydia Cabrera, quote, for many years the potencias ñanigas were a refuge for criminals and for the people in the last days of the colony, ñanigo became a synonym of for thought. In 1875, Spain inaugurated the political prison of Fernando Po. In my dissertation's third chapter, I analyzed the work Memorias de un Deportado, 1903, Memoirs by a Deported, by Manuel Miranda, a unique testimony about a Cuban Abacua deported to the prison of Fernando Po. In this text, I examined the Abacua presence and explored the nature of the deportations of Abacua members from Havana and Matanzas cities to 
the prison in the African island today in Yoko Island. I have found six first-hand testimonies by deportees to Fernando Po between 1858 and 1899. The first one, Los Confinados a Fernando Po, Impresiones de un viaje a Guinea, the confined Fernando Po, Impressions from a, a Trip to Guinea by Balmaceda, Francisco Balmaceda, and published in New York in 1860. A second edition was printed in Havana in 1899. The second one, Revolución Cubana, Deportación a Fernando Po, Relación que hace uno de los deportados. Cuban Revolution, Deportation to Fernando Po, a narrative written by one of the deportees. A text attributed to Miguel Bravo Sentíes, published nine years later in New York. He was on the ship San Francisco de Borja, which was the same as Balmaceda. Number three, Los Deportados a Fernando Po in 1869, Memoria Escrita por Juan B. Salubé, Una de las Víctimas. The Extradition of the Deportees to Fernando Po in 1869, A Memoir of One of the Victims, Juan B. Salubé, published in Havana in 1892. And I have three more, you can see all the titles there and I won't read it all. But the most important is Memorias de un Deportado, Memoirs by a Deportee, of a Deportee, by Manuel Maria de Miranda, was published in 1903, but he's, um, he's writing his own experiences as a Deportee, and that's the only text that mentions the Alacua. Fernando Po was under Portugal jurisdiction for almost three centuries. In 1777, Portugal gave Fernando Po to Spain. There are two versions of this transaction. The first one refers to the exchange of Fernando Po for Trinidad on the Brazilian coast. And the second version, the one I prefer, states that the Spanish crown received the African island under a secret treatise signed in Madrid on March 24, 1778 under Carlos III's reign in Spain and José II in Portugal. In 1827, England took possession of Fernando Po under the command of Captain Owen on October 27. England abandoned the island six years later, in 1833, after the legal claims of Spain. England alleged the unhealthy conditions of the island and those were the motives for leaving. After Spain recovered the island, the colony was in absolute neglect until the arrival of Don Miguel de Sanz in 1856. He was there with a, a Catholic mission for, with 40 individuals. That is the first time for the arrival of a Catholic mission. Before 1856, only Protestant missions were there. The official faith of Fernando Po was Catholic, but there was freedom to choose other denominations or even non-denominational cults. Most of the African population in Fernando Po uh, was Protestant. By Orden Real, Royal Order, on June 14, 1836, only the Portis convicted for eight or more years were allowed to be taken to Fernando Po. On August 27, 1841, the authorities decided to send only political convicts. But the deportation of Ñanios never ceased. They were considered as dangerous as the revolutionaries. The Arakua deportation to the island began on the middle of the 19th century. Hundreds of Arakua were taken on numerous trips from Havana until 1899. These testimonies are the evidence of the significance in a political and ideological ground of the deportations to Fernando Po. According to Isabella de la Sandi, quote, the deportation of Ñanios to Africa was in part 
due to their association with rebel groups in the decades and years prior to and during the War of Independence, so that their image is presented with negative characteristics that led to their isolation by the colonial society. The Spanish government sent a sizable number of Cubans to Fernando Bo. This fact was also documented in the diary by of the British subject John Holt, published in 1948. Holt describes the deportees as poor wretches in search of lodging and food during the early days of their stay on the island. Holt also states the dispro disproportionate difference between the two groups. Quote, there was no more than 100 Spaniards to 150 or 250 Cubans, end of quote. The Abacuat corporations were more numerous in the 1890s, but still there was a substantial number of Afro-Cubans in the first wave. wave. Most of them were imprisoned just for having tattoos on their bodies. There are four big deportations waves. The first one, 1866, later 1869, 1881, and 1896, which were documented without many details. We know from the press that the first deportation of 1866, at the time of the governor of Cuba, Francisco de Lezundi y Ormachea, Many Yanigos were sent to Fernando Po. The official records of deportations don't provide many details. On the other hand, the press selectively points out how many Yanigos were on the list of deportees. After the first arrest of the Potencia in 1888, the sacred objects from the Yanigos altars were sent to the Museo de Ultramar overseas museum and were displayed in an exhibition. This was the triumphal entrance of the Ñanigos into the cultural panorama of Spain. According to the articles that I have found in my research, we can, we can access to the following data. And you can see the chart there on the slide. 150 ñanigos, con estos son 230 los individuos de esa asociación deportados a nuestras posesiones de África. The total amount of 230 includes those in Fernando Po and the newer arrivals. 181 ñanigos y varios políticos muy conocidos en la isla. 181 ñanigos, that's that was in La Iberia. 1896. Uh, El País, 1897, 97 ñanigos, 20 political prisoners. La Época, 1897, 31 deportados de estos 13 ñanigos, 31 deportees, among them 13 ñanigos. And El Movimiento Católico, Católico 1897, chief note stated, 24 confinados, 24 confined, 69 ñanigos, and rustlers. I have already transcribed and collated all the documents related to the Abacua deportations from the Matanzas archive in Cuba. And I have been working since uh, 2018 at the Slave Society's Digital Archive in the History Department, where I found in 2019 the first documents related to the Abacua deportations in Matanzas, Cuba. I was transcribing the volume Religiones Africanas, African Religions, from the Archivo Provincial, and found a series of deportations between 1844 and 1899, in which the deportees were accused of being members of the society and labeled as rustlers and anarchists. There are some examples of the language used in those documents from Matanzas. These are some examples. Ñanigos y de malos antecedentes. Ñanigos and bad reputations. De malos antecedentes y miembros de la ilícita sociedad de Ñanigos y ser todos en extremo, en mismo grado, todos perjudiciales a la sociedad en la que vivimos. Bad 
reputations and members of the illicit society and all those who are extremely harmful to the same degree to the society in which we live. Forgive my wordiness, but this passage was written in police reports in the echoes and mindset of an 18th century xenophobic colonizer. Not all individuals were deported to Fernando Po. Some of them, some of the Ñanios, remain in the political prison of the uh, Isla de Pinos in Cuba. And because the Aracua were considered dangerous by colonial Spanish authorities, they were not pardoned in 1898. However, the pardon that benefited other political deportees, deportees didn't apply to the Ñanios, Cuatreros, the anarchistas. Abacua society affiliates, rustlers, and anarchists. They were absolved after the independence of Cuba, one year later. Historical evidence collated by Asandi suggests the deportation of 1,500 Ñanos in the second half of the 19th century. Due to its small state character, the society, the Abacua society, and its members were considered a threat almost impossible to control. Their political power, the regularity of their meetings, and the prevailing brotherhood were an absolutely disturbing factor of unity for the colonial authorities. Additionally, racial prejudices and social stigma of the first members of the Arapa society were Afro-Cubans, descendants of the enslaved Africans. They didn't belong to a privileged class. The complex Cuba economic mechanism that gave birth to the convoluted social certification was the variable that segregated the enslaved and their descendants from the predominantly white upper, upper class. The enslaved sons inherited the macula and social displacement as their parents did, according to the colonial tradition. The violence against, against the enslaved and their descendants was inherent to the slavery system. At the end of the 19th century, the Abacua were represented as cuatreros and anarchistas. Thank you.
Still others pondered going to uh, Liberia and referred to it as the colored man's land of promise. During the late 19th century, these statements by Southern black leaders who immigrated to Liberia or black settlements in the Midwest or the South reveal a unique form of proto-black nationalism that sought to achieve self-determination primarily through land acquisition. And in my study uh, of the book project Involuntary Pilgrimage, uh, it documents this uh, nascent nationalist ideology of black Southerners who
know they weren't yet participating in part of the body politic. And so scholars have to employ a broad definition of political activity to fully credit and represent their political assertiveness. So when I began this project um, over a decade ago here at uh, Vanderbilt, I was using um, uh, my Microsoft Paint <laughs> uh, and the technology has just moved so quickly and I'm trying to keep, keep up even though I'm not in school now. But I was taking the little paint uh, can and Microsoft Paint and trying to dip it in each county on a map that I uh, cropped out on Google and images. And this sufficed for uh, the dissertation over a decade ago and into the years uh, coming. But then as I'm attending conferences and uh, things like that, I just notice all these grad students and undergrad students who are using awesome maps. And so I um, had to find out how to do it myself. So I started taking, uh, oh, and this is the type of data that I collected in mapping movements from different counties in the South. And this data is primarily from the antebellum and the post-Civil War period. But in, in uh, um, construction, in construction, the data and documenting the immigration movements from the South, I would uh, track the town, the county, the ship, the state, the number of immigrants, the year, and uh, the source that I got, got it from. Um, I, and just let lesson learned, I should have been doing this uh, really <laughs> thorough uh, documentation from the get, but uh, so I had to go back and do a lot. But this is what kind of the raw data looks like. And so from this, I uh, also started to learn more about ArcGIS and um, ArcMap and uh, ArcPro and things. And so I started kind of taking classes and coming to Vanderbilt and learning more at their workshops too in the Center for D Digital Humanities. And so um, from that, I am able to use uh, Coral Class or graduated 
whereby movements in multiple locales occur during the same year or multiple counties. Consecutive patterns where movements occur in the same county uh, during various years, so consecutively. And then contingent qualities, whereas county movements don't appear in isolation, but more often than not, there are adjacent to other county separatist movements. And so, um, it's the idea that one movement will have a positive effect on inspiring other movements in the same locale. And these categories aren't necessarily exclusive or of, of each other or anything like that. They can overlap. So what I mean that a uh, movement within, uh, let's say, Davidson County can also uh, occur as the same time as a movement.
More than likely, subsequent correspondents must have noted some benefits of Liberia as immigrants continued to leave from the county throughout the 1880s. And so in North Carolina, from 